This is uh, a bit of a different presentation. It definitely has nothing to do with Seaside. It's about my, my PhD thesis and what I did in the past um, four, three years uh, at the University of Bern and what I will finish. Uh, and more or less I will, will present the same stuff at my, my defense in, in a month from now. Well, without the demos, of course. So I, I added quite a few demos and I also focused a bit more on, on Putty Parser because I thought that this would be, would be most interesting for you. So uh, the thing about Smalltalk is that it's a highly dynamic language that we all appreciate, right? However, when it comes to the, to the syntax or to the semantics of the language itself, it's, it's uh, everything but dynamic, basically. So you cannot change anything. So you are uh, totally locked in. Of course, because the compiler, at least in most small talks, access is accessible, you can patch it and change it, and this is what various projects have been doing. But what you end up with is basically a wrecked system, right? So the debugger is broken, the tools usually get broken if you are uh, unlucky, even the, 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 the source code management stuff is broken. And this is kind of the problem I uh, have tried to solve with Helvetia. So I, I wanted to be able to, to dynamically change the language of Smalltalk and um, to get a much, much more flexible system than just, uh, just Smalltalk. And, and to do that, I, I took the metaphor of Switzerland. So that's my ho home country, the, the University of Bern is somewhere here. And the interesting thing about Switzerland is that similar to uh, a large software project, uh, there are different languages used. There are different official languages used. So uh, here in this part, there is um, the French speaking part. This is the German speaking part. We have some Rumansh speaking parts that are uh, quite small. And those that were at ESOC in Lugano, they know that down here uh, people speak Italian, right? So we have uh, a system or a, a country that uh, where multiple languages live closely together. Switzerland is, is, is by, by no means the only country where this is the case, but uh, it, it's a good example, I think. Now the interesting thing about Switzerland is that these, these borders are not really that visible, right? People sometimes live in the French-speaking part but work in the uh, German-speaking part or they are married to uh, Italian-speaking women, etc. So there is quite some, um, some mix up there. And, and this, this is the, the most important thing, I think. The infrastructure is everywhere the same. So no matter what language you speak, um, you use the same money, you use the same supermarket chains, the same law, the same street system, everything is the same. And I wanted to apply these ideas uh, to small talk so that we can use multiple languages uh, and, and still use the same tools, even so there are uh, uh, different languages are used. And that's a, a small example that you will see later on too. Uh, what you see here is essentially a, a, a the normal Smalltalk debugger uh, with some Smalltalk code, with some SQL code right in Smalltalk, with proper syntax highlighting, uh, the debugger can step through this expression, uh, or through these mixtures of expressions of different languages. Uh, we have even a regular expression extension so that you can have uh, regular expressions uh, inside Smalltalk, and Smalltalk is also inside uh, SQL, and SQL is inside Smalltalk. So you have a really tight interconnection of, of different languages. And how this is done, I, I would like to show you in, in, in this, this uh, presentation today. So, as I said, wh what are the requirements that I, I, I collected in, in, in the beginning of my thesis? So I wanted to be able to adopt, extend, and overload the language. What does this mean? So adopt means to change the semantics, so to change the way the language behaves when you write some, some source code. Extend is to I introduce new syntax. For example, you want to introduce a uh, regular expression as a first class entity. That's a new syntax that you introduce into the language. Or to overload, that's uh, the third kind, that's to, to, to bend or change the way the, the current syntax works, and you will see some examples here. So multiple context dependent languages. So the different languages that are integrated into our host language, in this case Smalltalk, 
uh, should depend on context only. So it depends where you are currently in your class, in your source code, in your method. Uh, a kind of a different language is active or, or a different set of languages is active. So that was the first requirement that we collected. The second requirement that we collected was uh, homogeneous data and code abstraction. So all code should use the same uh, executable representation. And that's also why in the Helvetia logo I have this tree, which is essentially the, the AST of the host language. In, in our case, the AST of Smalltalk that, that serves as a, as a common execution um, platform. And homogeneous data uh, representation means that we can pass data from one language to the other. There, there are no boundaries for, for, for data uh, between, the between the different languages. And that I already talked about quite a bit, so the homogeneous tool support, so your Smalltalk debugger that we all love, uh, that should just continue to work even though it's maybe not Smalltalk anymore that you, that you are stepping through. So that's, that's basically what Helvetia provides, and I'm now going to show you basically in three steps how Helvetia is built. First, the lowest level is kind of a macro system, uh, those that know Lisp, We'll, we'll probably see some similarities there. Then on top of that uh, is a, a language box system implemented, which is a, a system that allows you this tight interconnection of different languages inside the same method. And last but not least, I'm going to show you uh, a bit the more in-depth view of Putty Parser, which is the technology behind language boxes and, and Helvetia in general. And if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Uh, I haven't really prepared the demo, so I will just show you a bit around the environment. You can al also download the image that I'm using uh, here to do the demo and uh, from, from my Hudson server, of course. So it's, it's a freshly built image that I downloaded yesterday evening. There are some bugs still, unfortunately, um, in, in the code because uh, what put me off a bit uh, in, in, the, in the past half year was the introduction of, of closures in, in Faro. And that kind of uh, threw up all the, the compiler infrastructure that I've been working with uh, in the past two years. And I had to rewrite big parts. And unfortunately, still some stuff with the, uh, with the debugger and closures don't quite work in the latest image. But you can, can also download an older image from, from the website, which, which works perfectly. Okay, so let's have a look at the, at the simple language extension, how you implement that in, in, in Helvetia. So who, who knows Mondrian, the, the graphic engine? Yeah, quite a few people. So uh, Mondrian I is an engine that allows you to, to, to generate visualizations. And this is a, a form shape of, that can be used in such a visualization. And uh, currently, it's quite cumbersome to, to define such a shape to use in, in a visualization. So actually, the Smalltalk code to generate this, this package shape looks like this. So we kind of have a grid here. And we give it some properties, how it should, should behave and how it should resize. That's what happens up here. And then you essentially add uh, a label shape here with a border and a color and and the package name, how that package name is received. And you add another shape down here with, with this code, and, and, and you set uh, similar properties. Um, it's kind of a lot of code for just these two rectangles, right? So uh, what we thought is, is, is to improve that a bit and maybe write that as that. That would be already uh, quite a bit shorter and I guess also easier to understand. And it basically says the same. So we have removed a lot of, of duplicated uh, code. Um, but that's still small talk, right? That's, that's perfectly valid small talk. However, the compiler won't compile that. It will comply that, uh, uh, that the variable row does not exist. It will say that it does not understand uh, what that means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, you could now patch your object to maybe make something meaningful out of that. But uh, we, we do it slightly different. We, 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 we transform the AST of this code 
to, to something uh, that can be compiled and that has a meaning. And we call that kind of a language, a language that is small talk, but that requires different semantics to be executable. A pigeon, which is a simplified form of the host language, and it introduces new vocabulary and semantic meaning. But that's not all, right? So, for example, a, 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 a graphic designer will still be not able to, to write that code because uh, he essentially or she essentially needs to know uh, small talk to be able that kind of to be able to write that kind of code. So what we do is is we go one step further and basically introduce also a new syntax. And now this looks really like CSS, a bit intermixed with small talk. Um, we have essentially the same specification. We, we have the columns that we specify, we have the, the label that we specify up here and the empty rectangle uh, down there. And we call this language uh, a Creole, which is a new language formed from the contract of multiple languages. In this case, we got inspired by CSS and, and, and of course also Smalltalk is used for the, for the um, values here in this, in this, uh, in this specification. So, how is this now actually implemented in, in, uh, in the Helvetia system? And if you know about extensible compilers that, or, or about the macro programming languages that might look very similar. So this is the, the traditional Smalltalk compiler as you find it in Smalltalk 80 and in most today's uh, Smalltalk uh, systems. So whatever gets compiled uh, comes into this, uh, bunch of classes. Uh, first there is a parser that uh, builds a parse tree and then this parse tree is somehow passed into the semantic analysis and the semantic analyzed AST is then parsed into the bytecode generation and uh, the bytecode essentially results in the end as a, as a compiled method that can be installed in some class, right? Um, and now with Helvetia, we basically extended this model uh, to make uh, any part of it changeable and, and, and mutable. So what we did is we introduced some hooks basically in between each of these steps uh, and added the possibility to intercept these, uh, these parts. So for example, um, well, so for example for the, for the Creole that we saw before where, uh, or for the pitch and I should start with the pitch and uh, this is the language that would, would just reinterpret the, the way Smalltalk uh, behaves. So it would use the normal Smalltalk uh, parser, then do a transformation on the AST so that the code becomes compilable and that it has a meaning, and then pass it back into the normal, uh, into the traditional chain of, of changes. Or for the Creole, we have uh, the CSS parser and the Smalltalk parser, so we essentially uh, skip through the normal small talk parser. We can call it from here for the certain parts, for the values, for example, for the expressions. Uh, we do a transformation and then we pass it back into the normal chain of, of, of the small talk compiler. And that, that's, this, this part is basically not new. That's, that has been, has been done for years in, in Lisp and in Haskell and in other programming languages that have a, uh, strong metaprogramming facilities. What we did, though, is to add a common rule system to these things. So there is a small database that is, is basically small talk code with, with uh, behavior that defines how these transformations are applied. And the same rules do not only affect the compiler, but can also affect the tools. So we can use these tools to, for example, define new completion actions in the editor to define the syntax highlighting, to define new kinds of contextual refactorings, et cetera, et cetera. So all, all this infrastructure bases on this, these general rules. And as you can see from this arrow here, the rules are basically just small talk code in your image. So you can do everything from within your image while the image is running. And this gives really the possibility to have homogeneous embedding. As you see, for example, here in this screenshot, this is uh, a debugger stepping through this um, CSS example that I showed you previously. And 
If there are no questions so far, I would quickly like to show you how this looks in real life. So the first example that I'm going to present is uh, our Roman numbers. This is a very trivial language extension. In, in fact, it's probably the most trivial language extension you can think of. And it's about using Roman numbers in your small box code, right? So what we have here is a test case that uh, uses some Roman numbers. And the cool thing is I can actually debug that, right? So I can uh, step through this code as through a normal SUnit test, right? And, and the tests even pass. Now, how is this implemented? Basically, uh, these transformation rules I define on, on the class side, and they have uh, some annotations. So that's the, the implementation of this, this little language extension, of this, this pigeon language extension, because I can just reuse the small talk parser and just have to rewrite the AST a bit before, before going to bytecode. So what this does, it defines uh, a pattern. So any variable that appears in the source code is, is looked at. And if this happens to be a Roman number, it just replaces it with, with, a, with a token that represents this number. And when you have a look at the, at the source code here, at the decompiled code, I mean, you see, oops. I hit somewhere strange. You see that it, well, there is some compilation defect, decompilation defect, and that's probably a bug in Faro. I'm not sure, but you see the idea. So it, it just essentially compiles down to normal integers. So that's what happens behind the scenes. And Helvetia ensures that the mapping between these, these Roman numbers and uh, the numbers in, in, in the compiled method are mapped correctly, so that's why the debugger is working. And then in a, in a very similar way, I can also define here the highlighting, so that's why I see the, the, the Roman numbers in, in, in gray highlighted in my editor, right? So that, that's a really trivial example. Let's have a look at a bit uh, more sophisticated things. So some of you might know this uh, Turing uh, language called BrainFuck. And it, it's, it's really a complicated language. And I've never quite understood how it worked until I, I implemented it here in, in Smalltalk and I could use the debugger to, to step through it. So I have to open a transcript. So this program is supposed to print hello world on the transcript. Uh, where is the transcript? Let me open that. And then I have uh, a method that opens a debugger on this thing. And now when I step through this and made all the uh, parts visible, you see that it should eventually print H and L and O, etc. And and you see down here, you see the actual uh, brainfuck machine. So uh, what it does when you uh, when you press a dot, it basically prints the the dot the dot operator basically prints the the letter that is currently under the head. So the head is is, is this thing here, and the plus increments the number on the head. Uh, the greater than shifts the head to the right, etc. So you, you can really understand uh, how this works and, and how this, uh, uh, what the semantics of this thing are. Now, ideally, Helvetia would really allow you to just um, replace all these, these parts up and uh, below the, the source code pane uh, to display a nice visualization of, of, of this language, right? but at the moment I haven't implemented that. But Helvetia could potentially support such rules that would uh, allow you to replace certain parts of the standard tools with, with more uh, dedicated uh, displays. Yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted to know what happened if you press into. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. That's a good question, yes. So when I press into, I end up in the, in the implementation of the BrainFuck machine. So you see this increments 
uh, the value here in the in the data pointer by by one just by by using normal small dot code. Yes, exactly. So you, in, in this case, you end up in the implementation of the of the language. Another way would be to really compile that into the method everything, but then the methods get kind of long pretty quickly. So that's why I, I chose to to um, to move everything out of here, out of the out of the method itself, right? Yeah. Would you mind uh, showing the decompiled method? Yeah, if there seems to be something broken in this image with the decompiler, but I can try. The decompiled code, yeah, well, yeah, okay. Looks like that, right? It instantiates this machine and for every command it, it, it does something. So that's for example the loop, it creates a, yeah, it's not something that you want to write or look at really, but. The question then is if you want to write or look at something like that either, but <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's a good example for, for the capabilities of, of, um, of Helvetia. You want to see some more example or wha what's the time anyway? Okay, yeah, I have to hurry a bit, I guess, again. I should not get lost in too, too much demonstration. So if you want to learn more about Helvetia, and you will see that in the, in the future too, um, I always put some references there so you can also find that on the homepage of Helvetia. Uh, each of these parts is basically documented in some, in some research papers, but they are quite small talky, all of them, so uh, I think they should be easy to understand. And uh, we wrote about this, this base layer system uh, in this paper at ECU. So now, why do I need something else on top of that, right? Uh, the problem wi with, with this, this system that you saw up to now alone is that it works really well when you have one language extension or you have another language extension, but it does not work at all if you have two language extensions together because the rules don't really compose, right? If you have a uh, Brainfuck enabled and, and, and your regular expression language extension enabled, uh, they don't compose. You can, I think that's pretty clear, right? So, but the problem is that I in many languages and in many scenarios, you really want a tight interconnection where you can combine different languages closely together. And even in Switzerland, it's like this. So there are various regions here, here, and over here where there is not just one language spoken, but actually a mixture of, of several languages, or, or your neighbors speak one language and, and you speak the other one. So we wanted to support that scenario too. And uh, to do that, I would like to quickly uh, guide you through uh, an example of how we integrated regular expressions into, into standard small talk um, syntax. Let me see if I can find this example here. Uh, kind of hard. <laughs> so language boxes basically take a bit a different approach. These are not rules anymore, but uh, a delta to the original host language. So to define a language box, you essentially subclass language box and you implement the method change that specifies how to change the, the host language. And in case of, um, of the regular expression language box, that just allows to put regular expressions anywhere into the Smalltalk code, you uh, instantiate this change object. Uh, you say, okay, whenever a primary expression, this is a number, a string or something in Smalltalk is expected, you can also expect uh, a regular expression. And those that have seen the Putty parser uh, presentation see that this is essentially a, a little putty parser written inside uh, your chain specification. So this language box will just insert this, this parser or inject this parser into the small talk grammar at, at the specified point. And we have here um, uh, some um, specifications of how to compile that to executable code and how to highlight that in uh, in the browser, so these are the two 
examples that I commonly use. And this is how this language extension then looks like. So we have normal small talk code, but with the added capability of, of using regular expressions. So you see the highlighting works. I can type something here. I can also debug through these things, of course. Uh, when I hit debug, I can step over these things. And that just uses the, the normal regular expressions behind the scene, the normal regular expression implementation of, of Faro behind the scenes. So it, it, it's very efficient and, and a neat way of, of, of using these kinds of, of, of things. Lucas, uh, can I? Yeah. Uh, so when you have a primary or whatever it's called that uh, makes sense in multiple of these extensions, how are they somehow prioritized to which one you pick for a given instance? Yeah. Exactly. The language boxes are prioritized on the import in which you enable them. So you can, for example, here on a language box, you have some, oops, you have a menu with, with language boxes, so you can enable, disable it, for example, and you can look at the scope. So this, this tell gives you a browser and, and tells you where this, this language extension is all used, right? And then when I open a browser on one of these users, I can look at which language boxes are active here. In this case, it's just one language box, so the order is not relevant. But otherwise, it would display you a browser that has an ordered set of, of language boxes. So it really depends on the order in which you import them or in which you add them. So if I would add another language box here, that would come after uh, and take a lower precedence than than the regular expression language box that I already added. But I have a few more slides on that, and there are also mm, some other problems that can arise when you combine multiple language boxes. Other questions? Okay, then I move a bit to the theory of, of how exactly language boxes work like. Um, a language box, as you as you already saw, more or less, basically consists of three things. That's first of all the change. That's this this delta thing uh, of the concerns of one or more concerns. This is how it compiles, how it highlights, how it behaves in the environment, and of the scope. This is where it's active, basically. Uh, the, the language changes, as you saw, a, a high-level description of, of, of a, a delta in the grammar of the host language. So uh, the regular expression looks like that. I, can, I think I can quickly go through that because you saw most of that already. Uh, the primary uh, production in the Smalltalk grammar, among a few other things, accepts strings and, and numbers. And when we say we want to add the regular expression, it essentially adds it to the end of the choice there. There are also uh, a few other composition operators. It's not just the only composition operator, but that's basically the most useful one and, and most used in practice. Then the language concern, as I said, I is used to define the production action. So in case of the compiler, uh, the code that transforms this token to a regular expression, to a small talk regular expression object, and, and lift is kind of something that I stole from, from functional languages. They use that to, to lift something to the AST level, so it creates an AST node from this regular expression uh, object and inserts it at that point. So this, this regular expression, contrary to when you use regular expression in, in plain small talk code, um, is compiled at compile time and not at runtime, as in most other cases when you use an external library, right? Uh, and the highlighting is really simple too. Huh? You just uh, basically assign colors or, or text formatting to tokens. And similarly, you can, you can do other things like you can have uh, contextual menus, you have custom inspector, you can specify search behavior on, on certain kinds of tree nodes, you can have custom navigation uh, concerns, you can introduce uh, a different kind of error correction or error reporting code expansion, I, I never really got to that one, but, but code completion kind of works, so you can also specify a, a new ways of, of, of completing code. And last but not least, the scope, I already said that mostly, uh, it basically answers, is the language extension active or not? 
and we have this menu, you saw that uh, language extension can be active system-wide, but in, in most cases this is probably not what you want. You can scope them to packages, classes, uh, and even methods, or, or basically any part of the system that you can somehow, somehow describe. Now, uh, to come back to your question is how you support multiple language extensions active at the same time. So the principle of how uh, language boxes get compiled or activated I is very simple. So we take the host language grammar and then each active language box in a given context basically gets the possibility in the order they are, uh, they are imported to modify that grammar. So uh, each language box changes the grammar. Language boxes that are not active at the moment just get uh, skipped over and, and they, don't, they don't change the grammar. So, and then in the end we end up with a, with a custom grammar. And we build essentially a grammar for every compilation unit. That means whenever you compile a method or whenever you start to edit a method, a new grammar is built that is just valid in this particular context and that is then used to compile or highlight or whatever you want to do with this, um, uh, with this, with this method. So this, this, this really gives the possibility to have fine-grained language extensions, to have fine-grained language scoping, and you get a composable and, and reusable model that, that works well with, with the existing tools. And this is basically, a, a language boxes are, are integrated with Helvetia. They internally use the Helvetia rule system, of course. So they, they cleanly integrate with the, uh, with the existing stuff. And you can even mix the, the two things. It just provides a kind of a higher abstraction level over the rather low level macro programming system of, of Helvetia. And we've written about that in case you want to learn more and see more examples uh, in the SLE paper in, in 2009. Are there any questions so far? Want to see more demos? Okay, more demos. I can show you the SQL example maybe. Um, if I find it here on the small screen, okay. So that's, um, that's a test that uh, is just plain small talk and here you have the um, here you have the method that you already saw previously in the, on the screenshot with uh, SQL in here. Uh, we have a regular expression in here and everything just goes together with the small talk code that surrounds it. And you see you get valid syntax highlighting so when I say limit 10, it, it still uh, detects that as, as, as valid SQL code and as a valid method. And I can show you the debugger, however, it doesn't quite work 100% uh, yet. There is something wrong with the start index, oops. But uh, in older images it worked. I just couldn't fix that in the plane either. So it seems to jump over this uh, SQL expression, unfortunately. But normally it would work. Uh, and of course, we can also edit the method in here. So if I really want to uh, change it, I can recompile it in here. Oh shit, that doesn't work. Okay, there are still some some errors to be fixed in this in 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 the language box implementation and the debugger. But normally that should work. Uh, yeah, I have few other examples that would be worth to look at. Something that uh, Fernando asked me to do, he uh, used to do a lot of OpenGL and he was annoyed that Smalltalk always had these keyword uh, arguments that are really a pain when you do OpenGL and want to, to, to call um, C functions. So I did a little Smalltalk extensions that allows you to call functions also like that. And like that. And you can even um, chain the stuff and you can nest the things, etc., etc. That, for example, tests if, uh, 
when you use the comma operator in Smalltalk that it does not conflict with the comma operator to separate the arguments, so you have to put it into separate brackets. Otherwise, it would be uh, read as an additional argument. And you can look at the implementation. That's basically the, the implementation that is needed to add this to Smalltalk. That's the change uh, that is done. So what this does basically is that it changes the way unary messages are parsed. And optionally, a unary message can have uh, these brackets with, uh, again, primary messages inside, uh, with, again, primary expressions inside that are separated by a comma. Uh, and then uh, a keyword message is essentially built out of this unary message. The compile uh, code looks probably a bit more complicated, but you get the idea. You just have to transform it then to, to, um, to some small talk code to make it work. What's the time? All right. 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. I, I think I, I go to pretty parser so that I can also show you some, some stuff uh, of pretty parser. Okay. So uh, these, these were the language boxes. And now the interesting thing and you already have heard quite a bit of that is, is how, how are language boxes uh, powered. Uh, and these are the dynamic grammars. This is essentially pretty parser that, that, that makes all this possible. So uh, a grammar is basically a set of rules covering what string are valid or allowable in a formal grammar uh, or formal language, like, like in Smalltalk. And, and the dynamic grammar, I, I, I wrote this definition myself, is essentially a high-level grammar that executes at runtime behaviors that other grammars perform during compilation. See dynamic languages. And that's basically the core idea behind Pretty Parser. We, we want to do as much as possible as, as late as possible, right? So we want to do the decisions not upfront. We, we want to... to uh, to be able to, to change stuff and to adapt stuff on the fly. And this is what, uh, uh, what Pretty Parser done, does. So it's, it's late bound behavior, it's a first class representation that you can transform on the fly and, and you have res reflective and, and introspective facilities. So, and, and why we would want to do that, you already know, right? Basically for this language change. The the delta of the host language. So we have a model of the host language that we want to transform to something slightly different or something slightly more complicated uh, to be then used later by different tools. And traditional grammars would, would, would hardly work with such an approach because traditional grammars are either written by hand or automatically generated, right? So that wouldn't work. We would need to recompile and, and rebuild the whole grammar, right? And table-based grammars wouldn't work for exactly the same reason either. We would need to recalculate all these tables and these are quite expensive operations. So that wouldn't work either. So that's why, why, why Putty Parser is born. And as you have seen in, in previous presentations, Putty Parser is, even though it was designed for Helvetia, it's, it's usable beyond that context. It doesn't depend on Helvetia. You can also use it outside uh, of Helvetia if you don't want to necessarily change the way how Smalltalk works. So we, we've seen that, uh, that example already in, in, in the presentation of Martin. So I'm not going into further details here. Uh, you, can, you can write grammars like that using, using plain small talk. But of course, Helvetia also provides a, a way similar to Ometa, and, and here, by the way, the debugger works, uh, to, to, to specify grammars using EBNF. So you can actually write that in Helvetia and, and you get the same grammar tree as you would write it in, in, in plain small talk. Uh, technically, I, I, I slightly prefer this way, even though so it's, it's considerably longer. But it makes everything a bit much more simple in Helvetia. It, it avoids all kinds of bootstrapping problems if you, if you, don't, uh, if you don't use this um, compiled form of writing grammars. So Putty Parser 
and that was also mentioned already, is, is a scannerless parser. Uh, you can build a scanner if you want, but in most cases it doesn't really make sense. So you combine scanner and, and parser into one entity. And this is what enables in the language boxes that uh, different grammars can be easily composed. If you have two entities like a scanner and a parser, composition of these things gets really complicated because you have basically to find two join points where you want to join these two entities. And if there is just one thing, uh, yeah, as you can imagine, this becomes almost trivial. Then it's a, a peg or parsing expression grammar that's uh, what describes that um, the parser is built from function objects that know how to parse trivial stuff, right? So the identifier is parsed from, uh, is built from letter parsers and number parsers. And the small talk grammar is built from identifier parsers that are themselves built from smaller parsers and a lot of other parsers, right? And and in the end, you can really have a nice compo composability with, with these, these pegs. Uh, putty parser is also a pack rat parser. So uh, this gives you kind of um, uh, guarantees on efficiency of the parsers. So uh, in, in most cases, and if you, if you write same grammars, then you have a linear parse time. And parser combinator, that goes into the same direction uh, 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 as pegs. So parser combinators are, are, are parsers as objects that you can compose and that you can recompose and decompo decompose and reflect upon. That's a, that's a key feature in, in, uh, in Putty Parser. And since you haven't seen that yet, I would like to quickly show you the, the uh, uh, a little tool that we wrote for Putty Parser to make it easier for you to write uh, grammars. So uh, that's, for example, the small talk grammar that I also use in the language boxes. So here on the left side, I see um, all my grammars that I have defined in the, in the system. And on the right, I see the production that these grammars consist of. So for example, I can look at what is an interesting, well, let's look at the identifier. That's kind of a simple grammar. So that's really the example that I showed you previously. It's a letter followed by one or, or zero or more word characters. And then in, in this tool, we have all kinds of other utilities that help you to quickly write uh, grammars and, and parsers. For example, we have a graph here that shows you kind of a visualization of, of the selected production. So I can look at characters. So that's a character, a, character, a dollar character, and any character which is the, the character in small talk, right? right. Uh, this is, for example, the expression thing. So it's, it's a, a zero or more assignment followed by a cascade expression, etc. So that's what you typically see in these, these grammar tools. Then we also have a map here. Uh, let, let, me, let me select the root of the grammar. So that's the complete small talk grammar visualized so that you can can see the structure of it. You, I haven't done, I haven't implemented this myself, so I, I'm not really sure uh, what it exactly displays. But you, you see all the production of the grammars, basically, and, and of the grammar and how how the productions are connected. Then we have several tools to debug your grammars. For example, cycles tells you the cycles of the grammar that are that would cause infinite recursion in the grammar. And that can be very useful while writing the grammar. And in this case, the grammar is totally fine, so there are no cycles, so it doesn't display anything. And those of you that have been attending some compiler lectures might know what first and follow sets are. So you can also, of course, if you have a graph of objects, you can, you can see, um, you can calculate what, what the first and follow objects are. So for example, for a literal, a literal starts with any of these things, basically. So uh, the string literal probably starts with the quote, uh, the array literal with the hash, uh, uh, parentheses, etc. Okay, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to get in there. Uh, 
and follow set is what can follow after uh, the selected thing. And then one, one funny, funny feature is that I just made by, by accident essentially is, is example. Example, the example tab <laughs> essentially generates you a random uh, string that can be parsed by the particular uh, selected uh, production. So that would be, for example, a random small talk method that is just generated from the grammar. It looks kind of ugly, but uh, it helps me to find some, some serious bugs in, 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 in the grammar. So uh, let's maybe have a look at something uh, slightly simpler. For example, that, that would be a keyword that can be parsed, right? So you can, you can see that. Or, or that's a, that's a, a, a random example of, of, of keyword pragma. And, and the most powerful uh, part are probably the dynamic tools. So let me just type here some, some small talk method, uh, self foo, and when I parse that, uh, I get some additional tabs down here that show me various things uh, that can be dynamically found while, while, while parsing this input code. So for example, what you see down there is essentially an inspector on the result of this parse. I also have a debugger. And, and that's really cool. And essentially, the debugger is 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 a is a trace of the parse of this this method. And what you see here is what the productions got activated while parsing this. And after the production name, you see the return result of this production. And productions in bold are a production that accepted the input and consumed the input. And and productions in um, in not bold are, are productions that that failed and that caused some backtracking. So when we go here through, you see it first tries to read the method declaration. It tries a keyword method, a keyword token, a keyword. However, that doesn't work, right? So it tries a unary method. It tries to read variable identifier. That works. So it goes into the method sequence. It tries pragmas. That doesn't work. It tries temporaries. That doesn't work. It tries statements. And that works. And then it tries all kinds of stuff to get a statement here, blah, 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 blah. Then it's uh, inside the expression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, you end up with the method parsed, right? And we have some tools to, to, to see the efficiency of the grammar. So for example, here we have a tally thing. So how many times each, each production was used in, in, in this grammar? So for example, to parse this input 12 times the letter or digit expected uh, production was used. And we have the same for, for time, but in this case, the grammar is so fast that you don't really see anything, uh, anything meaningful here. And last but not least, uh, the tool to show the progress. That's really cool if you have a, a little bit a longer method. So let me just go to the system browser and, and get something really ugly. And when I parse that, you see here basically a visualization of the progress of the parser in the input stream. So the input stream is from, from here to here. That's basically the string. The lines in, 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 uh, in blue are represent the characters. The lines in white are the, the white spaces in between the characters. And from top to bottom is time. And the black line is essentially the parser, how it progresses through the input. So you see this is a, is a very efficient parser. It, it basically just consumes forward. It, it, it rarely backtracks uh, uh, large parts. And, and like this, it's, it's quite easy to get a, a quite an optimal grammar pretty quickly. So that's, that's the pretty parser tool that I wanted to show you. This has nothing really to do with, with Helvetia, but it's a, it's a nice thing, I think, if you, if you use pretty parser. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Lucas, in order to understand the the language, the, the language box. I remember in your in one of your previous talks, 
you show an example, uh, a demo, where you mix SQL grammars and uh, Romance numbers at the same time. Yeah, yeah. That was I found like a nice example to to show, for example, how to solve conflicts if there are or how you can integrate yeah, both yeah. at the same I time. It's a nice example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't came to the conflicts. I, I I have some more slides on conflicts, but maybe I can show that afterwards to people that are interested outside. A lot of what you showed also has been used in Object Studio. Yeah. And it has been presented five years ago. Uh, would you, can you compare the way it's implemented in there? They basically use tree transformations and a subclass of parser uh, to the work you have been doing? Well, I, I'm not subclassing parser, right? Because that would, would prevent you from arbitrarily combining different languages and different language extensions. So what I do is really external to the parser that it can be composed to support multiple languages uh, at the same time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi, Lucas. I'm over here. I had the microphone. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, really, really cool stuff. How does it, in practice, when you mix all of these things and like write applications, does it work well having all these different languages, or do you just end up confusing yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, well, it, it depends a bit on, on, on your personality, I guess. What, 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 what is really important and what really helps is syntax highlighting, I think. That's the key. If you don't have syntax highlighting, you're really lost. And I'm just wondering uh, if you've also had time to contemplate uh, code storage in this sort of multi-language thing, you know, in your image you know which piece of code belongs to which context and you could probably take it even further and be able to assign different boxes even to nodes in the AST, right? You don't have to stop at the method level. Yeah, no, actually it doesn't stop at the, at the method level. You can scope it further down in, into the tree. Right. But, um, for practical reasons, language boxes are active uh, at, the f at the finest level on a method level, right? Mm -hmm. But then the language box itself can say, okay, I'm not interested into this method because nothing, um, nothing interesting happens there to me, or I'm just interested to change this little part inside that particular block. Right. Because you have the full access to the AST and you can do any kind of reflective tricks. Uh, but I'm curious more from the practical side. So we, you know, I really like this. I, I want to write my application with you know a bit of uh, regex here and SQL there. Now I want to save it and load it later somewhere in some other image. How is that possible today, or is that something that needs to be solved still? Yeah. Well, wha what I do is I um, put annotations on the class side what language boxes are active, and since um, and on object I overwrite the compile method, so it checks before compiling if all the language boxes are present. And then it, if not, then it adds them. So it integrates cleanly with the versioning control system like this. And when you load the code, it, uh, the language box model automatically ensures that the necessary language boxes are installed and active and are there. If they are not there, by the way, the, the system just compiles fake methods that throw an error and that uh, tell you, okay, there is a dependency on this language box, I cannot compile this yet. Any other question? Uh, Lucas, just a question. If I want to install it in a normal Faro image, is it possible now? Yeah, so it works in Faro 1.1. It doesn't work in any other, in, in Faro 1.1 core images. It doesn't work in any other image uh, at the moment because um, I need to tweak here and there in some compiler classes and some debugger classes, some methods to, to get the necessary events for, for Helvetia. And right. so yeah, it, it would need to be adapted if, if you wanted to run it in some other uh, image. There's a configuration of... Uh, yeah, you can load it. There is a loader, actually, yeah. 